As I have shared with you, uh, leading up to this morning, the book of Judges is kind of like a soap opera. And with every soap opera, you have villains, you have wicked situations, you have twists and turns, you have stars. But the stars in the book of Judges often uh, flare out at some point. And what we recognize really quickly is we don't need another role model, but what we need is a Savior. And really the only hero that we find in the book of Judges is God. One who reminds us that our merit can never match His mercy. That He is relentlessly rescuing His people who find themselves in problem situations over and over again. So if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Judges chapter 1. It's kind of toward the beginning of the Bible. And if you didn't bring a Bible, you can have the one uh, that is in the pew in front of you. It'll also be on the screen. And where we're starting this morning, Joshua, many of you may remember Joshua. Joshua had just died. And Joshua was one of two guys, Caleb was the other, uh, that were the remaining men that had been faithful to God's promises coming out of the promised land. There weren't many left. And now we just have Caleb, and he is uh, kind of the main figure, at least in this first chapter. And so let's just read that first chapter. We're going to get a little bit into the second chapter this morning. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, Who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? Now don't miss this in verse 2. This is really important. The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. And Judah said to Simeon, his brother, Come up with me into the territory allotted to me, that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I likewise will go with you into the territory allotted to you. So Simeon went with them. Then Judah went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into, his, into their hand, and they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek. They found Adonai Bezek at Bezek and fought against him and defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Adonai Bezek fled, but they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. Ouch. You're going to see a common theme uh, throughout the book of Judges, stuff like this. We'll, we'll discuss that here in a second. And Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table as I have done, so God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died there. And the men of Judah fought against Jerusalem and captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. And afterward, the men of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites who lived in the hill country in the Negev and in the lowland. And Judah went against the Canaanites who lived in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron was formerly Kirith Arba, and they defeated Sheshai, Imen, and Talmai. From there they went against the inhabitants of Debir, and na- the name of Debir was formerly Kirisephir. And Caleb said, He who attacks Kirisephir and captures it, I will give him Aksa, my daughter, for a wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it. And he gave him Aksa, his daughter, for a wife. When she came to him, she urged him to ask her father for a field, and she dismounted from her donkey. And Caleb said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Give me a blessing, since you have set me in the land of the Negev. Give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. So, quick recap. God said to the tribe Judah, I want you to go into this land where the Canaanites live. I have given it to you, and I want you to defeat them, drive them out, evict them from these lands. And what did Judah do? Exactly what God told them to do. They walked in obedience. But that's not the whole story. Look at verse 16. And the descendants of The Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up with the people of Judah from the city of Palms into the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the Negev near Arad, or Arad. I guess Arad, he he plays baseball. (laughs) There's a lot of names in here. I've read this probably 20 times. I still can't get them all. And they went and settled with the people. And Judah went with Simeon, his brother, and they defeated the Canaanites who inhabited Zephath and devoted it to destruction. So the name of the city was called Hormah. 
Judah also captured Gaza with its territory, and Ashkelon with its territory, and Ekron with its territory. And the Lord was with Judah. Now check this out. And he took possession of the hill country, but he, and he is not God, it's talking about Judah, he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. And Hebron was given to Caleb, as Moses had said, and he drove out from it the three sons of Anak. But the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. The house of Joseph also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. And the house of Joseph scouted out Bethel. Now the name of the city was formerly Luz. And the spies saw a man coming out of the city, and they said to him, Please show us the way into the city, and we will deal kindly with you. And he showed them the way into the city, and they struck the city with the edge of the sword, but they let the man and all his family go. And the man went into the land of the Hittites and built a city and called its name Luz. That is its name to this day. Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Bet Shean and its villages, or Tanakh and its villages, and the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Eblium and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages, or for the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in the land. When Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not drive them out completely. And Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites lived in Gezer among them. Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahal. So the Canaanites lived among them, but became subject to forced labor. Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Akko or the inhabitants of Sidon or Alab or Azba or Helba or Aphek, or Rehob, so the Asherites lived among the Canaanites, inhabitant, inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Bet Shemesh, or the inhabitants of Bet Anath. So they lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Bet Shemesh and Bet Anath became subject to forced labor for them. The Amorites pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down to the plain. The Amorites persisted in dwelling in Mount Harris, in Ajalon, and Shalbum, but the hand of the house of Joseph rested heavily on them, and they became subjects to forced labor, and the border of the Amorites ran from the ascent of Akrabim, from Selah, and upward. Woo! Everybody just go, whew! Man, that was tough. So here's what we saw, though, in the first half. We see that those who... Uh, God, said to, uh, God said to Judah, I want you to take out these folks, and they did exactly what God said. The second half of the chapter, though, we constantly see the Israelite, Israelites saying, we could not do this, or we did not do this. And rather than operating in obedience, they compromised the promises and faithfulness of God. Now, I think there is a unique issue here, and I want to address that for a second, because in the book of Joshua and Judges, the only time that we see this in all of Scripture is where God is specifically asking His people to drive out and evict other people. And this probably, I mean, if you think about it for a moment, this ought to cause a concern if we don't rightfully and contextually put it where it should be. Because if this were to happen today, we would call this ethnic cleansing, or we would call it a holy war. And the reality is, is that's not what God's desire was. Certainly going to war is justifiable when you're attacked, but that's not what was happening here. We even can look at the Ten Commandments and see, we know that the Ten Commandments say, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, And yet it seems to be that there's an exception being made. And so let me just address that for a second, because there are some distinguishing things about what God is asking them to do that are entirely different than military action or a holy war just based on conquering. And one of the first things is this, that the war is not carried out on the basis of race or ethnicity. The purpose was to break down the altars and get rid of idolatry before God. It was not one ethnic group 
versus another ethnic group. In fact, we see this. Uh, there was many times in the book of Joshua and Judges where those who were not Israelites were made righteous because of their faithfulness, like Rahab. Second thing is this. The war is also not based on uh, imperialistic expansion. God doesn't allow Now, this happens, but it's not because God allowed it. It's because the Israelites were disobedient. But God does not allow the Israelites to plunder or enslave people. He simply said to, to defeat them and to drive them out. Again, the mission here was not for prosperity or power. It was to create a country that, that the Israelites could honor God without pagan idols. And, and truth of the matter is, I mean, the reality here is the Israelites were weak in the face of temptation. And God knew that they were weak. So God had to remove some of those relationships that were creating those issues for them. It's also true that uh, this war was part of God's divine judgment. It was part of God's divine judgment. Listen, the Canaanites were an insidious group of people. Ritual prostitution, child sacrifice were normal, everyday occurrences in Canaanite cities. In fact, God had already warned them, you better get out of here. And they chose to stay. See, what I think this points to is how sometimes a relationship often has to be removed in order for us to follow hard after God. So, sometimes you have to sever a relationship to walk in obedience. And if you don't, those idols and those issues will eventually enslave you. In fact, if we look at the, the whole of Israelite history, they find themselves enslaved and exiled multiple times because they chose not to obey God. And the same is true for you and me. But I want you to hear God's response. So we're going chapter two. We're only going to do five verses, okay? I don't, I don't have a, uh, enough spit in my mouth to, to finish off all those names. So this is God's response to Israel. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. Remember that in, in, uh, uh, in chapter 1, verse 2? I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this that you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochum, which means weeping. And they sacrificed there to the Lord. Okay, so reminder here. First part of chapter 1, God looks at Judah and says, I want you to go defeat and drive out the Canaanites. I want, I want to purify this land so that these idols, these pagans, will not be in the way of a relationship that I dearly want to have with you. And we see, we see Caleb, we see his, his brother Othniel and his wife, they're radically obedient in this way. They're expressing wholehearted discipleship, that they're following God, radically keeping the promises regardless of the cost. But the second half of chapter 1 of Judges, we are reminded that half-hearted discipleship always leads to compromise. Over and over again, we see where they choose to disobey God's ways. I think oftentimes half-hearted disciples sacrifice the important for the immediate. You're probably looking at their situation saying, you know, it would reason to me that it would be better for me to do this or for our tribe to do this or for our family to do this than to really do what God said. It just makes more sense, right? I mean, have you ever said that? But half-hearted discipleship always starts with compromise. And it started in verse 19. I mean, go back for a second if you have your Bibles. And it says this, And the Lord was with Judah, and he took possession of the hill country. But he, Judah he's talking about, 
He could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. Wait, hold up for a second. Because in chapter 1, verse 2, God had already promised Judah that I am going to give you the land. But they look at these chariots of iron and say, boy, I don't know. You couldn't possibly do that. And, and, and here's where, where God's about to get Mr. Rogers on, on Israel. I mean, he's about to get all up in their neighborhood. And, and, and he calls out their contradiction here where they're constantly saying, I could not do that. Benjamin didn't drive out the Jebusites. Uh, they, they let guys go and they ended up starting other cities. Manasseh didn't drive out. Bethshan, uh, Ephraim, Zebulun. It goes down every tribe. And this is what God says to them. He says, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. And God speaks to the contradiction that was happening in the life of the Israelites. When they were saying, oh, we couldn't do that. You know, I just can't do that. God was saying, oh, no, (laughs) no. It's that you wouldn't do that. That you won't do that. Now, I don't know about you, but it certainly has happened with me at times where I will make an excuse and I'll say, well, I can't do that. But the reality is, is what I'm saying to God is I won't do that. And I think it'd be important for us just to pause for a second and think about what that means. Oftentimes when we say, I won't, just like the Israelites were saying, you know, uh, I I can't do that. I mean, I couldn't possibly do that. I'm unable to do that. But yet God has promised something. He said, I will give this to you. And the reality is, is we're not saying that I couldn't. We're saying that we wouldn't. Not saying that I can't. We're saying that we won't. But listen, these are poor excuses to a God who is always faithful on his promise how often do we do this? I mean, think about this for a second. What about forgiveness? I say, man, I, I can't possibly, I can't possibly forgive him or her. I mean, you wouldn't believe what they did to me. You wouldn't believe what they said to me. You wouldn't believe that they, they just stole that right out from underneath me. I can't possibly forgive them. Listen, I know how easy it can be to withhold forgiveness and allow the anger and bitterness to continue just to creep in. The desire to get even and retribution. And sometimes when things aren't going well and we just want to have a bad attitude, we like to have the excuse of just unforgiveness. Why are you so upset? Well, you know, so-and-so did that, right? But what we're really saying is that I won't forgive. Forgive. And remember, God is so much more interested in reconciliation in our relationships than us being right in our relationships. Amen. There's some relationships that, that you've been saying, you know, I can't forgive. Reality, you're saying I won't forgive. What about generosity? I can't give what God desires. I, just, I couldn't possibly give what he desires. I'm unable because, you know, whatever. And essentially what we're really expressing is that I, I don't want to take responsibility for some of the financial decisions that I've been making. Or, or I'd, I'd prefer comfort over obedience. So I, what we're really saying is I won't give to God what he ultimately desires. Now, if I got some return on that, then I might. But we may be saying, I can't, and when in reality, what we're really saying is we won't. Listen, you want to break the power of greed in your life? You've got to give. You've got to be generous. I mean, that's the only way you can break the power of greed. You've got to stop saying, I won't. You've got to give. What about temptation? Man, I just can't resist doing that. I know it's wrong. 
but I just can't resist it. You won't believe the power it has over me. I just can't do it. Listen, I, I hear this all the time from folks. I hear this from people who are experiencing uh, uh, just addictions, all sorts of addictions. You need to understand that uh, that's exactly what the enemy wants to do. Sin is addictive. That's why so often it looks so good, it tastes so good, it feels so good for a time. But sin is addictive. You see, the enemy puts temptation in our path in order for us to give power to that sin rather than recognize the power that we have from God to break it. Amen. And listen, I'm not suggesting that you can just merely overcome things by sheer willpower. In fact, I find that to be pretty arrogant. But oftentimes when we're saying, I can't, we're really saying, I won't. When in reality, we, we can get help. We can place ourselves under the submission of godly counsel. We can seek transformation. We can be accountable to somebody. You say, Eric, man, you just, you just don't understand. I mean, you don't understand the power it has. That may be very true. I may not be able to understand, but the truth of the matter is, is nobody needs to understand for you to do what's right. Amen. I'm not diminishing or minimizing the power that addictions have on us, but if we sit in addiction and we say, I can't, or really I won't, we never allow God's power to be released in our life. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, providing a way of escape. Man, that's good news. I'll tell you this, though. This is probably the hardest thing for me when it comes to the can'ts and won'ts, and that's truth-telling. It's truth-telling. You may go, well, it seems like you do that every Sunday morning. Boy, it's, it's much harder in, in well, I hope you say that, but... <laughs> It's much harder, though, in personal relationships. And, and, and we say, I just can't tell him or her the truth. It would destroy her. It would destroy him. I mean, if I actually told him that, man, that would be so embarrassing for me. What if they don't like me anymore? You know, I, I just won't risk the cost of that. I would rather disobey. And yet Ephesians 4.15 says, speak the truth in love. Listen, the root of our disobedience is failing to remember God's character and promises. That's right. Let me say that again, because this is, this is where Israel, Israel, they got off track. The root of our disobedience is failing to remember God's character and promises. Listen, the root of our disobedience is a failure to remember God's character and promises. Listen, when he says, I am going to give this to you, when he says, go and do, when he says, go and be, He is empowering you and me to walk in his faithful promises. And when we fail to remember that, see, for the Israelites, they, they, just lost con, they, they just lost touch with God. They forgot what he had already promised, what he had already said. And oh, how important it is for us to go back to God's promises, his faithfulness, so what do we need to remember? First thing is this, is God's faithfulness is a filter for our decision making. God's faithfulness is a filter for our decision making. If we go back to chapter 2 verse 1, we see it says this, the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum. Now that is significant. Now, we, we may look at that and go, well, I'm not sure how that's significant, but it's significant that he came, the angel came from Gilgal. Why? Because in Joshua chapter 5, God made a covenant with the people of Israel. 
Where? Gilgal. You know the word uh, Gilgal means to roll? That's when God was saying, let's roll, boys. Let's go. Come on. It's time to roll with my covenant faithfulness, with my promises. And so this angel comes from Gilgal. Why? To remind them what happened at Gilgal. Boy, it's important for us to remember when God has spoken. We need to write that down. We need to put that somewhere so that we can go back to that place. In times when we feel confused or frustrated or angry or bitter or what do we do next so we can go back to where God has spoken in our life. The the Israelites forgot to go back to that covenant that was made at Gilgal. See, it was a reminder to the Israelites that they have been saved by grace, that the Lord rescues and keeps His promises. You know, rather than go back to the covenant promise, the Israelites used human reason to determine their future. What a dangerous place for us to be. We know the consequences that took place with Israel. They said in chapter 1 and chapter 2 that they were going to have to live with those idols. They were going to have to live with those consequences, it says, as, as a thorn in their side. Anytime we walk in disobedience, we are creating consequences for ourselves. We may not like the cost at which it means to sever certain things in our life, whether that's uh, a a, a relationship or um, uh, something that we're doing on a regular basis. But understand this, the longer we wait to sever those relationships, those actions that are outside of the obedience of God, consequences will get greater and greater and multiply. And one of the consequences to their disobedience is that they would eventually find themselves in exile and captivity. I know how true that is. I mean, sin does captivate us, not just in the sense of taking our attention away from things, but in the sense of putting shackles on our body, our mind, and our emotions. Listen, every day, we have the opportunity to filter God's faithfulness in our decision-making. Every day we have that opportunity. That's why it's so important to be in God's Word. I mean, you, can't just, you, you can't just rely on a Sunday morning sermon. You've got to be in the Word of God on a regular basis so that you can remember the character of God. This is where He reveals His character. I am going to preach to Him. It's truth-telling time, baby. But every day you have an opportunity to filter God's faithfulness through your decision making. I mean, what does that look like for you as you spend money? What does it look like as you think about your children's activities? How much you guys are going to be involved, the type of taxi service you're going to be running around with, the decisions for your company. Listen, God needs you to make godly decisions in your company so that you can bring glory to Him right where He has planted you, man. He wants wants you to bloom right where you're planted. What about your classroom? Second thing is this. The deepest you can go is obedience. You've heard me say this many times. The deepest you can go is obedience. Look back at verse 2 of chapter 2. It says, And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this that you have done? You want to experience the presence of God? Walk in obedience. Walk in obedience. Man, I, I love it when I hear people tell me, I want more of God. I love that. And it just excites me. I'm glad. I hope you want more of God. I hope that on a daily basis, you're just sitting there and you're just like, man, I'm thirsty for some God. And I want me some, I want me some Lord, Right? And I hope you want that. But oftentimes when I hear people say that, what they're really saying is, you know, I want some more of God as long as it doesn't cost me too much. You know, as long as it doesn't 
create some discomfort in my life or cost too much time or relationship or money. You know, as long as I don't have to leave my comfort zone, we, we like to have one foot in and one foot out, right? I mean, that's exactly where the Israelites were at. But to combat that, here's what we do. I mean, we, we, get, we enlist in more Bible studies, right? So we try to do like three or four Bible studies because if we just have three or four Bible studies, we'll have more of God, right? When it might very well be that he's just saying obey. Or we'll pray for somebody else to do what God's been telling us to do. You know, I've been praying that God would do this. You know, maybe, maybe God's asking you to be the answered prayer. Or we'll hide in our busyness and that just becomes an excuse. Or we'll poorly prioritize our extracurricular activities. I don't have time to do that, even though we know that God has spoken. And then we turn around and we say, man, I want more of God. And we got three Bible studies going because everybody knows you got to know Greek and Hebrew to be in the presence of God. (laughs) But we're still not experiencing His passion and His presence. And what he's saying is walk in obedience. The deepest you can go with God is obedience. And when we delay or discontinue our obedience, we divide our loyalties. Let me say it again. When we delay or discontinue our obedience, we divide our loyalties. Listen, the Israelites had not wholly rejected God as their God, but they also hadn't wholly accepted Him either. And anytime we have divided loyalty, loyalties, it creates instability in our relationships. I mean, you know how that works. I mean, can you trust somebody who doesn't have your back, who you know won't do the right thing, even when it hurts? No. Listen, you may be stuck this morning. You may be thinking to yourself, man, I don't even know where to start. I do want the presence of God. I think there are some things that God has said to me. And here's what I would say to you. Real simple. Just do the last thing God told you to do. Just do the last thing God told you to do. I mean, you cannot go wrong if you'll just go back to that last thing that you you know God spoke into your heart, into your mind, and go and do that. Walk in obedience. Listen, God wants lordship in every aspect of your life, regardless of the cost. But understand that the cost is greater if you choose not to walk in obedience. Thirdly, lastly, and this is my favorite point, and this is, man, we're going to get to see this throughout the entire book of Judges. And this is, is that God ceaselessly offers grace to people who don't deserve it. Man, y'all ought to say amen. I mean, we ought, somebody ought to say hallelujah. I mean, we ought to jump back up like Carrie had said a second ago. I mean, because that is really good news, that he offers grace to people who don't deserve it. But here's where the tension is with God. I mean, this is a tough position for him to be in because on one hand, he cannot tolerate sin. He cannot be in the presence of sin. And yet, on the other hand, He cannot tolerate the fact that he would be apart from the people that he made a covenant with. And that's a hard place to be. You and I could never juggle that tension to be both just and merciful. I mean, God pursues you and accepts you. And listen, way before we ever pursue or accept him, okay? He binds himself to you by covenant, by promise. Just like he had back in Joshua chapter 5, and as he reminded them in Judges 1, 2, he, he reminded the Israelites that he had bound himself to their legacy. He had bound himself to their ways. And if you're a follower of Jesus, he has bound himself to you. You are in covenant. He is in covenant with you, covenant promise with you. But this is where the tension is boldest. How can God be both just and merciful 
with the people who are deliberately saying, I won't. Right? How can he be just and merciful with the people that are constantly saying, I won't? How can he juggle the, the sin? I mean, because he can't tolerate that. And yet he longs to be in relationship with you and me because of the covenant promise that he made. And listen, here's the good news, because this is where the gospel intersects the Old Testament. This is the great news. Because it's on the cross that we begin to understand how God resolves this tension. It's on the cross that our sin was given to him so that his righteousness could be credited to us. It was on the cross that God made him who had no sin to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. On the cross, God poured out his wrath on his people in the person of Jesus. Why? Because it satisfies both justice because sin had to be punished, but also it satisfies mercy because the covenant promise that he has toward us when he accepts us and forgives us. Listen, here's the deal. If Jesus' gospel didn't happen in our life, we would either live in guilt, fear, or continual sin with all the consequences that come with it. And yet, it's at the cross where we see God dealing with our sinfulness and it's at the resurrection where God solidifies his ability to give us new life. So here's the question posed this morning. I mean, here's the key application point for you and me this morning. Is where are you saying I won't to God? Has he spoken to you in such a way, he said, I got this, let's roll. And you've been saying, you know, I can't. I couldn't possibly. I'm unable. And reality is, you're saying, I won't. And where is it? You just need to lay that I won't down and say, I will. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your word. Man, I love... (laughs) Lord, I love that we can look at a text that is over 3,000 years old in Judges. A story that took place almost 3,500 years ago. And you make it applicable to us today. That you can speak to us that your character never changes, your personhood never changes, your promises are always good. But Lord, you desire more than just for us to understand, to be informed. You desire for us to obey. So Father, would you help us recognize the I won'ts in our life? And give us, give us the boldness to say I will. Not out of blind faith, because... We know your promises are good. You have a long history of faithfulness. But we would choose to follow you because we recognize that you and you alone are the best and only option. In Jesus' name, amen.